Um, well, welcome everybody to um, our fourth book, book group, which I've just been told is taking place on the 701st anniversary of the Declaration of Our Brook. Um, and uh, we're very thrilled to have our first two male speakers um, th this time. It's usually ladies. Um, we've got Professor John Frank and Alan Sinclair. And we're going to be looking not so much at the, the kindergarten stage itself as what comes before and why it's important that we're thinking of the whole of early years, not just the bit between three and seven. So um, I don't think I have anything else to say other than that Kate will be watching the chat box. So if you've got any questions or comments, please put them in there and um, we can put them to our speakers afterwards when we get to discussion bit. Right. So first of all, I have to um, introduce Professor John Frank. He's Professor of Public Health at the University of Edinburgh and also Professor Emeritus of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And I actually recently saw him described on um, some publicity for another talk he was doing as a public health rock star, which I think is one of the best descriptions anybody could possibly have. So um, looking forward to your rock star um, presentation, John. And I believe, are you going to screen share? Do you want to sort of put yes, the screen Yes, I'll do that. Thank you. you know. Well, hello everybody. And uh, having attended the other book club evenings. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this one as a speaker with my friend and colleague, Alan. Um, we're going to step back a little bit, as Sue said, and think a bit about uh, the public policy side of early child development. And in, in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about um, what I've called a case of policy influence failure. We failed to influence policy. In a, uh, in a pilot uh, that we ran um, about a decade ago in East Lothian of the Early Development Instrument, which we'll explain in a minute. It's a standardized questionnaire for P1 teachers to assess holistically uh, the level of development of all of the students in their class once they get to know them around, say, Christmas of the, of the year. So uh, with no uh, further ado, so this horribly busy diagram, which I, uh, is not mine, but, but is very famous, is, work, is based on the work of Bronfenbrenner, uh, who did some of the fund foundational thinking about early child development. And all it tries to do is it, it tries to depict the large panoply of determinants of health, particularly social and economic determinants of health over the life course as we go from uh, here, you know, womb, infancy, childhood, into adulthood. And um, what you see with a red oval around it is early child development programs, which are critical to the course that people uh, are set on as they go through the voyage of life. Um, and this diagram appeared in one of the background documents for Sir Michael Marmot's report for the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, published by the World Health Organization in 2008. So, it has, a, it has a good pedigree. Now for any society to take seriously the influence of early childhood development programs on the future health and productivity and well-being of its population, it has to have a way of measuring child development at at least a few points in childhood. And that brings us to the question of what is a reasonable measurement instrument. And this story tonight that I'm telling is about the early development instrument, um, which, and I make no apology for this, uh, was developed by a Canadian, Professor Dan Offord of McMaster University. I won't I, um, take no credit for any of that. It was all done um, about two decades ago. Uh, so moving forward, what is this early development instrument? It's a teacher completed 104 item checklist. It takes about 30 minutes. You might think, well, that's not very much time for 104 questions, but it asks about everyday uh, abilities of the child. Can they tie their shoelaces? Can they be trusted to go to the bathroom and return? Can they ask questions when they don't know what is going on in the class? Can they get along with other children, share toys, 
that kind of question. And so it's very quick for teachers once they know their, their, their students to, to fill it out. And if, if you can tell by the examples I've given that it assesses children's global development and it's really getting at what they bring to P1 um, as soon as the teacher knows them well enough to fill it out. So it's, what's it tapping? It's tapping the cumulative developmental impacts of all the children's preschool first five years of life. And it therefore reflects their readiness to learn. It does not try to, unlike the SNSA testing. Now, taking place universally in Scottish P1 classes, it does not attempt to test the child directly. There's no involvement of the child so there's no trauma to the child about being tested. Uh, and in particular, it does not focus on what arithmetical uh, computations or language expressive or receptive language skills the child has. Is designed, and this is very critical since I'm a public health uh, doctor, to be interpreted at the community level. Why? Because it's to be used to improve the early child development programs locally based upon the findings. Now therein lies the rub because the EDI does not provide diagnostic or developmental screening information on individual children. We don't release results for individual children and therefore it flies in the face of what many educationalists re really re expect to have. They'd like to have a piece of paper to put in the child's file at school and that's not done with the EDI. It's actually forbidden under the licensing agreement from McMaster University uh, in Canada. So it, it has a lot of public health appeal, however, because it's measuring the community's average ability in the previous five years to bring children to the point where they are ready to learn. It taps five aspects of child development. I won't read them out. Uh, you can see that they're somewhat distinct, but there is some overlap. And in order to do that well, it needs 104 questions. Now, what we did was we were the first people to pilot the use of the EDI after adapting it to Scottish, to Scots, really, to broad Scots. We had to change one word. We had to change the word uh, bathroom to toilet because in Canada, a bathroom doesn't have a bath in it. And that's where the instrument was created. I always like that story because it reveals, as I think was it Mark Twain famously said that on either side of the Atlantic, we have nations separated by a common language. Uh, what we show here is the sample of children. We, we, we actually asked all of the children enrolled in P1 in all of East Lothian in the fall of 2011 to um, participate and the parents could opt out, but only 2% did. Uh, and what you see here is each of the uh, families had a, a statistic we call the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. And it's a standardized measure of how deprived the household is, not by virtue of its own particular characteristics, but by its local neighborhood characteristics. It's extremely well developed. It, it, it long preceded my arrival in Scotland in 2008. And it's one of the best respected measures of socioeconomic status in public health globally. So what you see here is that if you look at the sample we, we got from all the children enrolled in, in East Lothian, P1 that year, um, we had only 4% of children in the lowest fifth. These are fifths, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, 20% of the whole sample. And, and so actually that's because it's just not that poor a local authority. So actually that means we didn't have enough children for valid statistical analysis in the lowest group, but <clears throat> I'll give you summary um, results in a minute. I just wanted you to know that. And overall, uh, we had about 1,172 children in the study, um, about I think 90 of whom were already identified as special needs students. And this instrument's not for them. This instrument is to be used for normal kids who don't have special needs 
That's its whole purpose is to pick up the tendency for the of the community, the community's children as a whole. So you don't run them through this. The teachers don't complete it for children with special needs. We can come back to that if you're interested. It's a public health approach. What were the key findings? Overall, 27% of the East Lothian P1s, uh, over a thousand of them that we had the P1s teachers complete the questionnaire for, were developmentally vulnerable. Now this just means that their scores were in the bottom 10% of the whole East Lothian population uh, on at least one of the five axes or aspects of development that I showed you earlier. This is remarkably similar to the other countries in the Commonwealth, well, what was the Commonwealth at least, um, that I, I have statistics on. So British Columbia, 29%, Canada as a whole, almost identical, Australia a bit less. And importantly, the developmental vulnerability here that affected just over a quarter of all the P1 students was not just concentrated in the poorest children according to their family's index of multiple deprivation. In fact, even in the most privileged fifth, one in six children were developmentally vulnerable. But of course there was a relationship to being deprived in that 39% of the children in the most deprived fifth of households were developmentally vulnerable. So, you say there's a gradient, meaning there's a steady stepwise relationship between how deprived the family is and the child's likelihood of being uh, developmentally vulnerable. If we were to summarize broadly what the whole picture was for East Lothian five-year-olds that year, they did pretty well by international standards in physical health, well-being, and cognitive language development, I think that's because if you can function in broad Scots, you're probably better than average in, uh, in language. Um, they only scored average in social competency and they did less well in emotional maturity, communications and general knowledge. What you do with these results is you take them back to the community and we did that for five clusters of primary schools uh, that had the P1 students enrolled in them. And those of you who know East Lothian will recognize these clusters. I won't read the names of them. Many people had thought that the worst results in terms of the percentage, the percentages are shown here, 40%, 34% of children vulnerable, developmentally vulnerable on the EDI. Uh, and many people thought that the worst results would probably be in Trinent, but actually they were not. They were here in Musselboro. And this turns out to be because you're not tapping all the families, you're tapping the families who have five-year-olds starting school. And in a particular community, that might be people who moved into certain kinds of housing at a certain time. So they might not be representative of the whole local area. But what is astonishing is that even in a relatively well-off local authority like East Lothian, we had this huge difference between the North Barrack cluster with only 11% of children vulnerable and the Musselboro cluster with 40% of children vulnerable. So there are really local geographies that matter. And that means that those local communities need to use this kind of information to plan their preschool programming and ramp it up to meet the need. I'm coming towards the end. Sue's staring at me, so I have to come to the end now. So I've already made the point that uh, we couldn't get enough children in the poorest fifth by Scottish statistical standards of the population. So uh, I think we probably underestimated the gap between the richest and poorest families' children's scores. Um, if, if you did this study in Glasgow, the gap would almost certainly be steeper. Um, and we talked about where the greatest gaps occurred. They were in communications, general knowledge, and language and cognitive development. And there were remarkable differences inside a pretty small area of Scotland. And these local hotspots of poor child development at school entry are not, you can't just get them from, the, from, from knowing the index of multiple deprivation of the local neighborhoods. We have all that data, that's already there. The Scottish government uses it for many purposes. Because 
it is only the subset of families whose children are, as I said, entering P1 in a given year that you're sampling. And they could be better or worse in terms of the children's development than the social class of the entire community uh, on average. So what did we show? We showed that the EDI as a, a tool, a questionnaire for P1 teachers is acceptable. They liked it very much. They thought it was helpful to reflect on the children's developmental status in this holistic way. Uh, they didn't find anything about it inappropriate. There's no invasive uh, testing of children. It's affordable. It costs 20 pounds per student. You do it for one. That's what pays for one day of teacher buyout with a substitute teacher. And since you're only, since each birth cohort, each group of children who enter P1 in a given year is only about 1% of the whole population, it's not very expensive. You wouldn't do it more than every three years because in Australia where this has been well established, it turns out you just don't find out very much more by doing it more often. Child, child development patterns in local communities don't change that quickly, but they can be changed within a half a decade if you set out to use these data to inform local programming for preschoolers. So we've shown these big differences, even inside a, inside a small area, which is not that um, deprived, uh, even though it only has 130,000 population, uh, meaning about 1,200 P1 students enrolled in a given year. And we had an astonishingly positive response, as I've already implied, from the teachers, the parents, the local authority officials. And in fact, uh, they paid, they went and raised the money to do it all again in 2015, 16. We gave them some technical advice, but it was in, for a bunch of reasons I don't, I can't go into. It was impossible for us to get a grant to do that. This is no longer research. It became, I guess you could call it a practice question. Um, uh, research is a fussy little business. Um, having spent my life in it, I can tell you that research councils are not always interested in what's important to society. So um, it's anonymized, I've said that, but uh, it does allow us to uh, have parents opt out if they want to, but hardly anyone does. So that means you get a very clear picture of what is actually going on. What is one of the problems in getting policymakers to think about using the EDI? Well, in Scotland, I think it was not something they were used to. They were used to, as I said, a piece of paper that goes into the file at school of each student. They were focused on individual students one at a time as they come in front of them as teachers and headmasters and so forth. And that's fine, but failure to think about the aggregate, the community as a whole, is exactly the same problem we face when we try to get general practitioners to think about public health. They're used to seeing one patient at a time. We in public health, well, I was a GP for 21 years. I'm not saying anything negative about GPs, but their day-to-day -day life is one person at a time. What, what we have to do in policy terms is aggregate that up. So we think about the community and the communities deficits in child development, and then we address them with programming. If uh, it's another problem that I think doomed the EDI in the 10 years since we piloted it, there was a fight between COSLA and the Scottish government, it's not over, about who should pay for anything, anything new. And although this is a very inexpensive teacher questionnaire, uh, I, thought, I thought that was an issue. It wasn't very clear who should pay for it. Um, and it, I put an asterisk on this point because in Australia, it turned out the federal authorities, so-called Commonwealth authorities, realized that the states who were in charge of education wouldn't pay for it. Similar kind of, you know, bun fight about who should pay for what. And so the, the, the Commonwealth of Australia just paid for it and has paid for it ever since. It was, it's been done now, I think, four times across the entire uh, country of Australia for every P1 student enrolled. Um, and sometimes you have to take leadership that way, but that did not happen in Scotland. And I think it's ironic if you sort of look at it in retrospect that Scotland historically aimed for devolved decision-making to local authorities in matters like this, but the budgets, as we all know, have been so deeply cut since the 2008 recession that fundamentally the central government has dictated what testing is done in P1 to all the local authorities. That's, that's what's happened. And what we have as a result is the SNA tablet-based direct testing of children's three R skills, reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
It's not holistic. It's got social class bias. It taps what kids were taught by their parents and uh, others at home before school. And I would say that most experts in the field think it's of little merit as a measure of child development. Thank you. And there are some references and websites for your use. Thank you very, very much, John. Um, it, is just, it just strikes me every time I hear about it, how tragic it is that we didn't um, employ the EDI and we went for the SNSA, which is, um, according to everybody, I mean, they said it's formative as well as apparently standardized. I don't know how you do both, but the, even the experts in formative assessment say that it's completely pointless doing that sort of thing with children at the age of five. We spent such a fortune on it. Um, so what is happening to the, the kids who, the, the, those 27% who are not making it? Which brings us to our second speaker this evening, which, who is Alan Sinclair, CBE, I have just discovered, um, who has been CEO of a, a, a number of companies, but at the WISE Group were, is the one he's most well known for, where he said he spent many a long year hauling long-term unemployed young people off the bow uh, and then became the senior director for skills and learning for Scottish Enterprise. But his interest in those young people and why they were on the dole and why so much was often going wrong with their lives led to an interest in child development and it's probably been a bit of an obsession for about 15 years now, Alan, hasn't it? Um, yes. Published lots and lots of papers and things on it and his book, right from the start, about the first thousand days, was published in 2018. So right from the start, Alan, what's going wrong for them? Thank you, Sue. Um, and it's just me, no, no slides, um, no PowerPoint, but I nearly had my dog contributing to this session as well until I ushered her out of the room. Um, a bit of due humility. I, I'm, unlike most people who are tuning in tonight, I've not worked directly with children. I worked with long-term unemployed, many of whom I recognised at the time were parents many times over. But the way it was framed is they were long-term unemployed people, they were not parents. And I think what I have learned over the years, which I think I've brought to this topic, this whole enormous issue, is what's really important uh, is to frame the issue properly and have a sense of priorities within that. And I think the way children are framed in Scotland goes something like this. This is the kind of common sense view. Um, kids are interesting little things, but they're a bit like piggy, bank, piggy banks with a light on top. And the light goes on at age five when they go to school, and at which point you feed stuff into the piggy bank. And that's their education. And that's where they get the reading, the writing, the arithmetic. And if the kids are not doing well, the problem is it's child poverty. And that is the common sense take on it. And I want to say, I think this is one of our greatest obstacles to moving forward, this kind of deep-seated way that we wrongly frame this. Instead, I think we have to frame it around a set of Ps, um, which is preconception, pregnancy, and then what parents do, and largely what parents do even before they ever reach school, because this is the most important part of child development. I'm a big fan of what John's been doing with the EDI. I have advocated in this um, over the years. I'm also really struck by something that came out just before COVID um, hit us all. And that was that the Scots End, the people who do the growing up in Scotland, were commissioned to get a baseline for vulnerable two-year-olds who were entering a daycare as part of the expansion of early learning and care. And um, <clears throat> they 
did in-depth work with just under 600 children in their care settings with their, the people who worked there. And if I can just give you the figures, I thought I'd better write them down because it's a really detailed, rigorous piece of work. 50% of the two-year-olds uh, were behind in communication. 38%, this was the best score, were behind in gross motor skills. 60 were behind in fine motor skills. 67% were behind in problem solving. And 61 were behind in personal and social interaction. That's at two years of age. Now, why I found that so alarming, and I just think it's an almost enormous wake-up call, is that if you understand uh, what I've come to understand as human development, child development, uh, what Mother Nature gives us, but scientists have helped us understand it. People who are working on data help us understand it. We've got our own eyes and ears to look and see things and read. I think there's three big stages on child development. And the first one comes before conception. Uh, we need, you know, if you're going to have a healthy pregnancy, you need to have folic acid. It doesn't help if you're going into conception where you have an alcohol or drug problem or there's a lot of vi or violence in the house. I was going to say a lot, just violence because of the, the stress it creates on the, the, the embryo. The second thing, and that, that builds right the way through pregnancy and, and into the first uh, period of life. So there's something about before conception and getting prepared for, for birth. The second thing is that um, child development is a bottom-up process. It's a bit like house building. You need a decent site. You need drainage. You need the foundations right and then you go on and do the walls. Now, if you haven't got the process right, you do what we do in Scotland is you don't have these things right and you wait until the blue light's flashing and there's a crack in the gable end and then we rush in with different types of services or we turn the blind eye. But what I'm trying to say, it's a bottom-up process and you need one thing to be following another because child development is cumulative. One thing builds on the other for good or for bad. So I think there's three stages, which is conception, preconception, bottom up process, and then cumulative. And if we think about the results that John was pointing to at uh, five years of age, where 27% of the kids were already behind, the results from the vulnerable twos when we're getting you know, 50, 60% are behind on four out of the five main measures. I mean, are things going to get much better for those kids? Or is there already the bottom-up cumulative process making a decent life much more problematic? Not deterministically, but just much more likely. Um, I think it's also interesting what John was saying about the spread of the kids, where there were more kids who were struggling, who were from poorer households, but about, it's hard to look at the figures, but somewhere between 40 and 50% were actually spread over the three highest income groups. And certainly one of my favourite studies of all time is the Dunedin study in New Zealand, where they follow 1,000 kids from three years age up to now, well, 38 and 45, because in between those two, um, where their big, big conclusion now uh, is that the, the biggest proportion of, of criminality, hospital admissions, fatherless parenting, addictions, are based on 22% of the population. And that 22% of the population, to their surprise, was not to do with social economic status or IQ, 
but it was to do with how much self-control or agency the children had at three years of age. It's an, I find it an incredible bit of finding, um, and it stops me in my track, happy to talk more about it. But what I would like to move on to is the bit about assessment and testing. Um, my, I wish we were doing EDI in Scotland, and maybe it's not too late, it is more sensible. But my fear is that for so much of even the, 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 the testing that we're doing in P1, or if it was an assessment, or even the baseline on these kids in vulnerable twos, um, is that we look, assess, test, and then go, hmm, that's an interesting thing to put in a file. And what you find over the years is that certain kids get fatter files because more reports have been collected and assessed. Uh, in the nursery, they're maybe not playing with other kids. And at primary school, they're you know, causing a bit of hassle for the teacher. And at secondary school, nuclear war is broken out and we want to send them uh, uh, to Afghanistan. So. My worry is that we have to turn this around, away from um, just assessment, just testing, but think more, what do we do earlier to stop these things happening? And, and that's where I come into the framing. That this is, I think, it's about parents, what parents do and don't do. I'm not... I hope I'm not coming over as um, disheartened by all this because actually I'm really heartened and I'm really very optimistic because over the last 10 years, the Scottish government has made some major steps forward. It rescued the health visitor service that nearly got blasted out the sea. Um, it's made a major commitment to expanding early learning and care of which there's questions, but it's a major intent. And more recently, it's done stuff on um, maternal mental health, quite a serious way, and introduced the baby box. Now, I don't think any of those are perfectly um, set up, but I do think the intent is really good behind it. But what we need to be able to do is move beyond the mechanisms to start introducing something very radical called parents, mothers and fathers, into this process. Um, because I know we're often delivering services, but the services, I believe, should be there to support parents, not to substitute parents. It's to try and stop the kids coming in at that 22 or 27 percent who are not making it at a very early age. And there are ways of doing that, which I think you can even build on the stuff that we've got. With the expansion of early learning and care, it should be much more about a relationship with parents who are bringing their kids and what can the early learning and care centre do to support them. And when it's kids who are really struggling, as many are in quite a serious way, then we get serious practitioners like play therapists to be able to help and, and to spend real time and not just your normal daycare worker, who I have a lot of respect and time for, but so many of these issues are more serious and we need to put in the serious work to working with parents. Same with baby box. It shouldn't be the postman delivering it. It should be part of groups of people who are working through what parenting means, getting to know each other, helping to review their own childhood and then build on. So I could go on, but I just think we're on a bit of a roll. I think there's a lot of great things happening, but we really do need to think about the three Ps and we do need to think about what we can practically do to stop kids falling over into really serious things. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Alan. I'd I'm dying to add another P on there. I want it to be play at the end because that sense of agency at three 
that so those self-regulatory skills that's where those are coming from isn't it, it it's the, the, the imitation of the adults the care yeah. of the adults but also the, the opportunity for play yeah. right Kate have, have we got any questions coming through Suzanne's been saying amazing stuff in the chat box oh can we bring Suzanne in this is this is Suzanne territory big time isn't it have you got any questions uh, yes so Alan and John, what you're talking about is not new, it's not radical, the science is all there. The problem is not the science. The problem is, I think, cultural. And I think that's what you're saying. So what, what is it that you think stops us from getting it, right? If people are well-intentioned, and I think we are well-intentioned, I think our services are well-intentioned, but we don't get this or we would put in place different you know procedures we would put in place different practices and of course I will have lots of views about what that would be but I'll stop with the question what stops us from getting this well I'll start and then Alan can wrap up because he's had at least as much uh, tangling with policy in, in Scotland uh, longer than I have I've only had 13 years of it. I have some scars from that, as you can tell. Um, you know, uh, it's not only Scottish culture that has this uh, tendency, but I'm gonna call the tendency, um, uh, the view that, that, that merit always shows itself, that, that people with ability don't need help and that those who need help have less merit. It's, there's a strong belief in meritocracy that, you know, you just let the people with talent rise to the top and they'll be the leaders in society and, and that many of the other people are, don't have as much merit. So, um, you see, I don't believe that. I believe there's a Beethoven born every second somewhere in the world, but we never, we never discover them. And never mind a Shakespeare and all the rest of it. An Einstein, you can name your own brilliant person. Uh, and I think, um, I think that the view that it's all fine because merit rises to the top and we don't need to do anything special is so deeply ingrained in many Western democratic cultures that we have to constantly ask people how they think they know that. What is it that tells them that is true and challenge it very, very directly. I'm gonna hand over to Alan. Alan, what do you think? Um, well, I've got various thoughts on this. I, I think some of this comes down to a gravitational pull or vested interest. In other words, things that have gone there before in public services tend to create a bigger space for them and they create their own hierarchies. Universities get more money per head than secondary school. Secondary school gets more money than primary school. Primary school gets more money than nurseries. Yeah. And each of them would work pretty hard to make sure that it stays that way. If we put things into a health context, that'll go into the hierarchy that exists within health, which are usually surgeons. And then when you get into this area, Susan, um, it's not so much psychologists, but it's, you know, psychiatrists tend to manage the psychologists, unfortunately. So they'll think of psychiatric services rather than community type services. So I think in each area, we have um, a gravitational pool, a vested interest, and that happens in every area of life. I think we've also got a real issue. Um, a lot of senior politicians that I know a lot of, the senior civil servants that I've known don't have kids. And if they do have kids, they outsource the kids. And I think that's a real issue. And I think a third one is, you know, in some ways that this is a, a woman's issue as well. And women's issues just don't do well enough in the public sphere. So that's another. And on our side, I don't think we have been sufficiently coherent as to what it is we would practically and realistically like to see. So some of it's them, some of it's us. If, if I come back there.
of course, one of the um, stories in the news this week in England is that they've just funded 26 mother, you know, mother mental health units, 26 across the whole of England, yay. But uh, of course, it's once again seen as specialist. So what you create is mothers who are struggling and need some specialist help. And then you've got everybody else who is presumably fine and doesn't need things like Sure Start centers. And so if you outsource so many of the solutions to use your uh, lovely language there, Alan, you, it's just our whole conception about what babies need, about what families need it is, we, we are undermining ourselves because of the way we think about this, which is what both you and John are saying. Hmm. And that becomes can, can, I, can I chip in there too? Because that business of merit and meritocracy that John was talking about, it's interesting that he said, you know, there's a Beethoven born every minute and there's a, an Einstein. There's a parent born every minute, but actually we don't see the parenting job or the care part of, of, of bring, you know, being a human being as having anywhere near the same significance as some sort of achievement in art or music or science or whatever, the things that men have traditionally done. Um, so I do agree with Alan that a lot of this is because what we're talking about is women's work and women's work has never been valued. And, 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 and I, I had a granny who looked after me when I was little, uh, who was illiterate but incredibly clever, knew stuff, and was a wonderful person, is my heroine. Um, but that those people don't get valued, and they're the people that look after little children, and always have been. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually caring doesn't get great value in our society, across either old or young, and there's a bit of rope attaching these two things. It's low status, it's low income. It's what migrants do. Yeah, you know, it, it's all bundled in like that. That doesn't help us. Rather than actually understanding it's the spring of life and it's the, so many of the other issues we're talking about framing, so many of the issues that we are concerned about, obesity, alcoholism, violence. Actually, these are the similar issues, but it's, it's actually to do with how we parent. And, and we have actually in Scotland had the remarkable example of John Carnahan and, and Karen, the, the um, Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, taking a public health approach, mm -hmm. recognising all these things, changing the way that people looked at it and making the most incredible reductions in, in violence and, and knife crime and so on in Glasgow over 10 years. And yet, even though that has happened, in this country, we're still not seeing the public health implications of early education and, 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 and care no. and prior to it. We're not seeing its knock-on effect into the education no. system itself. Because quite honestly, if a child can't self-regulate when you put them in a classroom, from then on, there's going to be problems for every teacher that, that drops out. I, I am curious you know, that we've all faced COVID in the face. And that's a very big, strong public health message. And there is a real parallel with how about parenting in this, which is, you know, you, know um, you don't want to get COVID. You want to take everything you can, all the steps you can to not have it. Well, that's a similar message to what we're talking about here. You want your children not, on one hand, you want them to thrive, and you certainly don't want them to be debilitated throughout their lives. And if you get into the illness, it, it, a bit like COVID, it stays with you. Yeah. Sounds like we all agree again. <laughs> no, 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 I think, no, but I think, I know, I think it's hopeful. I think we just all have to keep shoving away. There's, hey. um, there's chat in the chat box about intergenerational support, mm. which is um, being taken up by early years a lot. And um, wondering if this can inform the discussion. Mm. 
Um, I mean, Sue was talking about grandparents and their involvement in their children and um, what's, and I'm also concerned about the 1140 hours and whose best interest that is in, you know, and um, is there enough choice for parents? Is, you know, is it what they want? I mean, a lot of parents are being offered what suits the um, centre rather than what suits the parent. It's all very difficult. Right? Yeah. So you know, there's, we're storing up difficulties maybe with some of these things. Yeah, but I suppose what I'm trying to, I suppose I found this a useful thing over the years, um, is to put myself not in my own seat, but put myself in the seat of the health minister or Nicola or the main civil servant and think, right, if I was in their shoes, in their seat, what would I do now? What is realistically possible? Do you do, John? I, um, I, I, I do believe that most people who enter at public service, uh, certainly the civil servants I've dealt with in Scotland are well-intended people. They want to do the right thing. Um, but um, in the process of decision-making, many influences are important that have nothing to do with the science. We all know that. This has been demonstrated during the COVID pandemic. We needn't go into that. Um, and, and what tends to happen is that very strong personalities at the ministerial level, and sometimes the, uh, the, the senior civil servant within a ministry, drive things not according to any kind of evidence, but according to their beliefs, their personal beliefs. So if, if the person who is driving policy and the SNA testing, I have come to believe was in in the cradle being launched a decade ago when we did our study and that's why we never got an invitation to present it by the Scottish government never um, I, I think that the people who are in charge genuinely believe that to improve Scottish performance on the program of international student assessment uh, stats and all that that you got to start giving them the three R's. That's what they believe. They think you give them the three R's. And uh, the fact that many of the countries with the best scores in the world, like Finland, don't try and teach children reading, writing, and arithmetic till they're about age seven, um, don't even put them in regular school settings, is lost on them. You know, they, they think that the age five start time is, comes from science or some deep knowledge of human development no, no, this is a, a kind of, as you all at this table know, it's a, it's a fundamental way of, of, of trying to industrialize society. It goes back to the industrialization of British society. And, uh, you know, it hasn't got any deeper roots than that. And uh, unfortunately, there's some other parts of it which are very unfortunate. So uh, I, I think, you know, when you, it's not, it's no, it's no help to blame individuals in the policymaking process. And I think it's better to try and understand the dynamics that make bad decisions happen and, and struggle if you can. And I've had a good, a good chance at it. I wouldn't claim any victories as I've already told you, but I think it's important to work with people wherever they're at to try and give them a, a broader picture than they got from just their own upbringing about all this, which is the three R's are what matter and the earlier you start them, the better. I think that probably was what uh, at our last week's um, book group was why Lisa McCabe's suggestion that we ask for a review of early level with the sorts of information that Upstart and other people have been putting out and the recognition that the guidance now is a remarkable realizing the ambition document, which actually is totally at odds with the sorts of coaching that you need to do if you're teaching literacy and numeracy in primary one. So that teachers are, as Lisa said last year, put in an impossible position because how do you reconcile the two things? So that, that possibility of asking for an early years review seems to me to be probably the best way forward at the moment. And it would almost inevitably have to be done by early years people. 
Um, and I, I was wondering when we've been talking about all these different areas of government, if, I mean, Upstart's always talked about a minister that oversaw issues relating to early childhood from nothing to eight. I wonder if Alan and John felt that might make a difference in the Scottish Parliament, if there was somebody who had that responsibility. Mm. Because we do recognise 0 to 8 in our early years framework as the, as the, the early childhood. So a minister of early, early childhood. Pre-birth, pre-birth to 8. Yeah. What, do they think that would make a difference? Alan? Um, so behind the ministers, there's civil services an awful lot more integrated now than it used to be to actually try and take that span. Um, but I think we're still laboring under insufficient attention coming to that early stage, you know, where midwives still wouldn't, would struggle, where other than just passing them off to social work, to, to, to where would you pass a woman in distress? Health visitors still have caseloads of about 700 people. So I think there's something about the rationing across the system. And I don't think there's anything near like a lobby or an outcry to try and tackle this. I mean, we can all nod our heads on it, but there's no, there's no real voice, there's no elbow behind this. There's the whole issue of silos as well, isn't there? That, that um, basically pre-birth to three children fall into the health sector yeah. and the health sector itself is, you know, it's, it's the medical bit or the, it's the public health bit. Yeah. Um, and then once, once they're two, two and a half, two and a half um, if they're vulnerable, or three, they go into the childcare sector now because we've got a sort of childcare sector that's got its own department um, in the civil service. And then as soon as they hit school, they become the property of the education department. So, it, and then all the way through, the children with the most problems have got the social work department and they're all separate and they're all, you know, sort of fighting each other for funds all the time. Um, so that it, it's the if it's one of the most important things you can do is get things right from the start. We, we just simply aren't in a position to do it. Yeah, but I I, I think we are. There is just not enough of a, um, an outcry about that start period of life, and I don't. I cannot blame that on the civil service or or, or the ministers. Because in a way, they're just working with the, the kind of hidden theories, the, that kind of common sense view that I started my little talk with. The kind of, you know, that's how it works. Yeah, that's somewhere deep down. So Suzanne is saying that we, we're wasting money. The stories we tell ourselves about it costing money is part of the problem. We tell ourselves the wrong stories. Come on, Suzanne. Suzanne, come back. And you need to ex expand on that. We tell, I just laugh. I think do people not get bored hearing all the things I say because I just say the same things over and over again. What we are talking about is cultural. It's about our values. It's about understanding child development, but it's also about what we value. And so part of the way that you understand what you value and you change values is by looking at the story you tell yourself, both politically and culturally. So we tell ourselves the wrong stories. We talk about how it costs money. There's not enough money in the budget to deliver da -da -da -da. It's the wrong story. It costs us money. So when people, when we don't fund early years, we've wasted taxpayers' money. That's a basic point that Alan makes a lot. So if Told ourselves different stories, we would see the world in a in a different way. If we use the word more often, harm or damage, 
which sounds a harsh word, we would start to see it differently. Yeah. Talk to children, not intentionally. No, I, I, I think you're, I mean, absolutely correct. We, we do need the cultural change. The question is, changing culture is not quite like changing the light bulb. You know, it becomes just a wee bit more difficult. And when I have had to do this in, in managing big, complex things, there's a, there's a basic model, which actually I think applies here. If you do that, there's about 30% of the people say, hmm, that'll never work, no way, don't want it anyway. There's a, another lot of about 40% who say, well, let me see once you've changed it. I may, oh, that might be okay, but I need to see it happening. And then there's a group in the middle you can work with to change culture. And they, that sort of 20, 25%, then help to change and set the scene and get behind it. I don't think we've got that middle 25% yet to change the culture because you ain't going to start with the people who say, no way, or the other lot that say, well, once you've got it, I may join in. We ain't got that 25% in the middle yet. I'd love to have that. And I don't think I don't think we've got that coherence yet. I think we're moving help. towards it. I think we really haven't been I do. Shooting. And Suzanne's work uh, uh, has been remarkable in helping oh, yeah. the shift and, 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 you know, the, the attachment um, understanding that's going into many earlier settings. Um, or if we use words like culture change more, if that was part of the story that we told ourselves, we often talk about getting the science out there, increasing understanding. If we told ourselves a story about culture change within early years and we used mm -hmm language there it would give us a different vision about what the the problem is because lots of people think we just need to explain to people the science we need more than that so you could come back to alan and others and say okay how do you create culture change that is what part of what uh, upstart is trying to do but we we don't always use that language so i guess part of what i'm just saying is what are other ways of framing this that we could use whoever the we is to help us to to see what the pro problems and challenges are and so and I think more time on framing would really help a lot because i don't think um, we have collectively managed that well enough yet i mean i know that i'm sorry i'm inclined to acknowledge that i think there's been tremendous amount of progress in the last decade but you know, there's so much more to go, so yeah. Is it possible to let Elizabeth Anderson speak? For anyone that doesn't know, Elizabeth wrote chapter five of Plays to Way on inclusion. <laughs> I just popped a wee message into the chat box. Um, I was doing a bit of spring cleaning yesterday because I can't go away on holidays. So I, I discovered um, uh, this document from the Scottish Parliament, the Education, Culture and uh, Sport Committee, Wednesday the 8th of December 1999. And inside this, uh, there, there were two debates that day and we were part of the second debate, which was on uh, pluralism in education and raising the starting age to six or seven. And at that time, there was a Labour government and on the board of the Education Committee was a very young Nicola Sturgeon, who I had a chat with on the very first meeting because we appeared a couple of times. But we had a, you know, quite a big lobbying group and we all worked well together. We gave evidence to this committee and for about two and a half years, um, we spent a lot of time speaking to civil servants um, down at the Quay and, um, and in St Andrew's house. And, and eventually we ended up speaking to the, um, uh, the chief aide to the first minister who changed three times because we changed we you know the early days of our parliament was a bit of a rocky road and the the feeling I got all the time was that all the politicians were genuinely and I mean genuinely interested in what we had to say they were interested in the welfare of young children they were interested in the future of these young children and they were interested in the impact on our society in Scotland and they genuinely were um, really happy to engage with us 
But what we found was that as we worked our way up the ranks of civil servants until we got to the, the, uh, the chief aid, um, I've forgotten his, the one I'm thinking of now was John, oh, I've forgotten his name. Um, he used to write articles um, in the, the Scotsman or the Herald it was as well. Anyway, um, when we spoke with them about it, what they basically said to us, we love what you're saying. We know that you're right but we can't actually do what you're asking for because we will have parents rioting on the streets. And when we talked that through, you know, I said, you won't have parents rioting on the streets. You'll have parents who are perhaps for a little while a bit disconcerted and a bit worried, but it will all pan out after a few years, it'll be fine. But they said, no, we can't do that because politically it makes us very unpopular. And so what I gleaned from that couple of years when we were lobbying was that whoever is fronting Parliament is really afraid of the scrutiny and the sort of um, cross-party brawling that happens um, within the chamber, which I, I just find abhorrent. I'm really sorry, I don't think it's helpful when people just shout at each other. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, so I then said, well, can we do anything? And they said, well, we can we can do something, but it'll have to be through the back door. And so things progressed for the next couple of years. And I had to change what I was doing slightly. And I couldn't go up and down to Edinburgh from Aberdeen um, so frequently. Um, and other people sort of took over my role. And what then happened was the inception of the early level. And I am utterly convinced that was their backdoor in to making the change that they all knew was right, but politically didn't, didn't want to be scrutinised for or blamed for should anything untoward happen. So I think where we are now is the next level up on that spiral. <laughs> and it was just funny. I haven't seen this document for years and literally it fell off a shelf. And I thought, 1999, oh, for goodness sake. So here we are again, and I think I think it is time to say, let's let's look at the early level again. Let's look at why it wasn't successful, because I think with the best will in the world, you know, it hasn't been as successful as we had all hoped when when it happened. And let's look at what we can do to make it even better. But also let's take the pressure off the practitioners so they don't feel overly scrutinized um, by people who are who are peddling basically the old the old three R's, which I should also say in this same committee report, I spoke a lot about assessment and the stress levels of children. And that's why I think we are exactly on the same level, but the next bit up on the spiral. So I think we should really go for it. I think we should really hold them to it and say this was wonderful what you did. Because I get, I get that if you're the person at the top, you don't want to be kicked for this. I get that. But at the same time, I would advocate on behalf of children and say, this is really what we need people. So let's keep going. So I think it's time to say, yes, let's reappraise that early level and let's reinvigorate it. And one of the things I think that failed it was the fact that we didn't have proper training in place. And yeah. most people still don't understand what play is. <laughs> You know, that's just how it is. Um, uh, Janet Moyles calls it a bubble. As soon as you think you've got it, it goes pop and it becomes something else. And, and, and that's why play is very difficult to understand. But I think it's something we really need to grasp now and say, right, we've, we've peddled this far enough. Let's actually get this to the next level. Let's sort out all the flaws. It was a good attempt. Um, round two, let's make a better job of it this oh. time. Oh, Elizabeth, I want to march on Parliament now, this very minute. <laughs> no, because, I mean, it is a perfect time, actually, to do a review of early level with the 11.40 coming in, with the whole issue about what do the P1s do in the light of realising the ambition and the tests at the same time. It's a perfect timing. So it, it really has to be our next big ambition, doesn't it, to do that? Is, and I is think Carol still a wrap? Sorry. I was just going to say one last thing. I think one of the ways forward with parents is to raise the mental health issue. 
um, which I did raise in 1999 with the Parliament. It's all written <laughs> there. And I actually gave that young Nicola Sturgeon a document called The Big Picture. And um, I remember speaking to her on the downstairs before we ran up to the chamber. Um, but I think it's the mental health issue with parents we need to get across. And we need to say, do you really understand what this is doing to their children? And not that children should be mollycoddled, because I'm not about that either. But I think this level of stress is completely unnecessary. Is, um, is, is Carol still around? Have we have we unmuted Carol? No, I, I just wanted to say that, um, I mean, I think, I think we're doing quite well on the culture change. I think that there is a noticeable difference. I think people are aware more of the importance of play and also of about early years and these sort of fundamental experiences. I, I think it's you know, radically different from where we were 10 years ago. I mean, would you not agree with that, Alan? I yeah, oh, yes, definitely. I, I think we have. And I think when it comes to changing culture, I mean, an awful lot of it is culture is emergent. It, it is actually, um, it, it kind of comes out of our conversations and our interactions with one another. We can shift it. I think we can shift it more than we think that we can. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at the, the tipping point, you know, with Malcolm Gladwell, I mean, I think he's right in saying things shift quicker than we when we think. And maybe we should look at, you know, how can we work with some of these ideas to kind of create more of a momentum? Because I don't think in Upstart, we've talked enough maybe about how can we shift the culture even more towards what we want. Um, well, actually, we have gone well over time, I'm afraid, but um, I got too interested in what everyone was saying. Um, I suppose I'd better say thank you very much to folk for this evening. I found it fascinating. I think the whole business of this early, early level review, it is very timely, exactly the right thing to be going for. But if anyone can think of other ways that we can help shift the culture, then please let us know. Our um, fifth anniversary is coming up, so we're interested in anything that we can do at the moment. And I thank John and Alan enormously for their contributions this evening and everybody for coming along. And um, we'll see the next one. We're not quite sure what the next one is, but we think it'll probably be in about a fortnight. So um, I hope we see you all again. But uh, thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. No. Wonderful. Mm -hmm.